it's not your fault that you ended up where you are, but it is your responsibility to get yourself out of it. That's how I look at it. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 152 of the Stroke Cast. Today, I talk with multi stroke and brain injury survivor Kwan Glover. This week's episode is brought to you by the fine folks at Modus Nova. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of an affected limb after stroke, visit strokecast.com slash Modus Nova. And by the fine folks at Like Minded. To find out if Like Minded can help you live your best post-stroke life, visit strokecast.com slash like minded. For many of us, stroke is the peak of our brain injury. After stroke, we can start on our recovery. From brain injury to stroke to stroke to brain surgery to painkiller addiction to a new focus and purpose on life, all before the age of 25, Quan's early adulthood has been intense, to say the least. This week, he shares his adventures, how he got through his trauma, and where things are going now. So let's meet Quan Glover. So Quan, thank you so much for joining us on the Strokecast this week. Thank you, Bill. It's actually a, a serendipitous that we connect. Uh, we were just talking beforehand about how our community hasn't been able to really connect. So when you found me, I just thought it was a great honor. And I thought it was a no brainer to join you on this cast. <laughs> well, that's that's great. And it's one thing our survi- our, our community knows about. It's no brainers. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, your your journey is is pretty amazing. Obviously, I think of myself as a young survivor, uh, having had my stroke at 46. You got a head start on that (laughs) couple of decades earlier in your life. So, I mean, what was your life like in before all this happened in the spring of 2014? Yeah, I had always been an athlete and a student. You know, I was really good at school, got straight A's pretty much all through school. And in my my first semester in college, I played football, I ran track, I ran cross country, I boxed. So I was, I had a pretty good life and I was set that I was going to be either on Wall Street, the head of a big bank, or I was going to be president of the United States. I was going to be somebody important um, just because of the things that I had done with my natural talent. Um, So it was a pretty, I, I, I believe that I was aiming for success. So I had a pretty normal upbringing, two-parent household. I was actually the youngest for a while, and then I had my sister when I was in high school. So, you know, I, I was like, an, I'm, I'm a technically a middle child, but I've been a role of older child, youngest child, and middle child now. So, I mean, you're going through that in spring of 2014 then. Were you in college at that point? Let's see. I came to college the fall of 2012. So I was doing the spring semester, or in, I ended the spring semester my sophomore year. And, uh, You know, I went right into the summer, financial internships, and everything was looking great. And then then that thing just happened. Things started to change. Yeah, I mean, that's that that's that point in the college career where those financial internships that can be intense, they can be fantastic learning experiences, they can be good, they can be bad, all sorts of different directions. But uh, but you started to have some coordination issues that uh, that summer then? I mean, did that come on all of a sudden or was it something that had been building for some time? You know, Bill, I remember laying on my bed and my hand, I would be typing, texting as a young person does and I would be clicking the buttons. And for some reason, my but my thumb would go to a different button that I wanted it to. And it would do this from time to time. And I would just, I was like, oh, that's weird. And then I would get up and sort of my balance would be off. And my mom was just sort of like, um, hey, did you take your allergy medicine? And I was like, oh, that's what it is. I, I'm having allergic reaction or something in the environment. And um, but it was very gradual. And then one day it came to a head. I remember I was sitting in an internship across my boss and he looked me directly in the face. And, you know, I was a young kind of brass kid. So he kept looking at me and I'm like, what are you looking at? And uh, he said, uh, 
you know, he asked me, was I okay? And then when I started to talk, the words like got stuck in my throat. He asked, like, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine in my head. But what actually came out was, uh, 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 and I couldn't get the words out. So fast forward a couple of steps and the doctor said, hey, there's something in your brain that shouldn't be there. And then I went home and then I, it got worse and I lost my vision, my balance, had bad headaches. And then I led to my first brain surgery in August of 2014. But then, being 20 again, I rushed right back to school and did everything the doctors told me I was not supposed to do. And this is all pre-stroke. So, again, I'm setting myself up for a um, interesting couple of months. I mean, they're basically telling you to sort of take it easy, but you're going into junior year of college. You're getting ready for next steps in your career. You're you're having fun as juniors in college do. and. All of that sort of leads up to uh, that stroke in September. I mean, what what happened on that day? I was uh, president of my fraternity, or uh, about to be, and I had some things I had to do on the campus mall, so like the big yard in front of the, the student facilities, and I had to man the table. I had some homework assignments I had procrastinated on. I had things I needed to do, but I started feeling these headaches. And it was it lasted all day and it was really bad. I was like, I can't stop now. I need to get these things done. And I remember in my last class of the day, I'm sitting there. I'm used to in a Charlie Brown movie when the teacher's talking. Uh, it, like normally it would sound like words and they're making sense, but all I heard was because my headache was just pounding and pounding and pounding. And it was debilitating to the point where I, you know, swallowed a bunch of Tylenol. I left the classroom without saying anything. And I, I tried to get to my apartment and do some homework. wasn't working, so I, I laid down in my bed. Ten hours, I laid in my bed, writhing, trying to fall asleep, and my headache would just not stop. It felt like something was tugging in my brain. And then um, I got up because my stomach started rumbling. And I'm like, uh, what is this about? I didn't eat anything. I didn't eat anything strange. So I, I ran to the bathroom, and I, I knelt before the toilet, and I threw up. But, you know, you suspect or you assume when you throw up, you're going to throw up whatever food you on your stomach, chunks of it, or whatever, strong odor. When I threw up, it was just water. Mm. And I was like, mm, that, that's not, that's not, something's not right. I backed away from the toilet trying to process what was happening. And then it was like somebody slapped my eyelids with, with smoke so I could barely see. And then I made it back to my bed. And when I crawled up on it, my right arm and right leg just completely went out. So I like fell on my back and I was like, oh my God, what's happening? And, I, and again, I'm by myself in my apartment. Me and my roommate don't really talk, so he doesn't know what's going on. And then it hit me. So I called the hospital and I come on my arm. I'm in tears at this point. I'm like, hey, mom, um, I think my arm is stroke. And that's where the rest of the, the journey kind of continued. Wow. So, I mean, as you're going through this headache during the day and all of this is really starting to build, are you thinking that this is related to the brain surgery you'd had a month and a half before? Or is it you, you're just thinking this is just something entirely different? You know, listening, I'm having this conversation now with you, Bill. I'm just astounded that I did not even remotely make that connection. I was like, oh, I, my allergies, or, oh, I didn't drink enough water, or oh, I'm telling a lot of stuff in school, this headache will subside. But it was it's clear to me as day now that there was an obvious connection with the headache of my recent brain surgery and the fact that I ran back to school a week after surgery and did everything the doctors told me not to do. There was an obvious correlation, you know, when I went back to weightlifting, which I shouldn't have done. My muscles were vibrating. I was feeling a lot of spasticity uh, returning. My voice, my words started slurring, but I just simply did not make that connection. But now I know that there was actually a direct tie um, to, to that headache and surgery. Wow. And, and you know, that's one of the, uh, the things that's so insidious about stroke and brain injury is that the part of our body that is supposed to tell us, hey, this is a problem. Don't do this. Things are going badly because of this reason is the very part of the body that is actively dying and failing at that same time. I mean, when when you're in the middle of a brain injury crisis, 
you're not in a position to make good or logical or barely sensible decisions. I mean, you know, the fact that you knew you were able to just realize I need to call my mother. I mean, that is the clearest thing your brain was able to do. And that was that was the very right choice. I mean, it's one of those things it goes back to what are our very most basic innate things that go in our go on in ourselves where are those old patterns we can pull from youth that we've had for years and maybe that can save us yeah i think the word insidious is a great way to describe it because <laughs> the thing that you need to do it's like your brain is not able to do it or tell you to do it so when you find yourself in situations also compiled with the fact that i was 20 years old and had zero i mean absolutely nothing I had no real life experience. I think that, you know, compounded into just the sheer ignorance and often arrogance that you think of at that stage. You're like, well, you're just like, ah, oh, I'll be fine. I'll wake up tomorrow and you'll be fine. Uh, you know, my plan was to actually go to a business conference that morning. But as you can see, I'm here now talking to you. So that <laughs> didn't happen. But it uh, in cities is a great way to describe it. But I often say that the stroke and all the surgeries uh, were actually the most fortunate things to have happened to me. And uh, one of those reasons is, is it is that because it led me to have this conversation with you and be a part of this community. So uh, in hindsight, it's easier to look back and be grateful. But in that moment, I'm just like, holy crap, I'm going to die. And that's not something a lot of folks in their 20s really have to uh, think about and confront that mortality. It's, you know, I, I wasn't experiencing a brain injury at the time, but I'm, I'm sure some of that early 20s mentality is what led me to, uh, at one point in college, the the brake light warning light came on in my car, uh, indicating low brake fluid. And my solution was to grab a piece of black electrical tape and cover up the, <laughs> on the dashboard for another couple of weeks, which probably wasn't the best decision at the time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so what was what what were the specifics about your stroke? It, would, it sounds like it was a hemorrhagic stroke. You're right. What was the the actual cause of it related to the previous surgery? It was definitely related to the previous surgery. Uh, I had a, something they call a cavernous malformation in my brainstem in the bonds area. So uh, what they did is they took a I forget what the scientific term is, a medical term, but they took an approach to my skull to the side and removed it. But they didn't, they were not able to get all of it. And mm -hmm. what a cavernous malformation is, is a group of blood vessels. And because of the stress I was putting, I mean, I was traveling for my fraternity. I was in, what, 16, 17 credits. I was doing a lot of different groups on campus. So the amount of stress created the, the perfect condition for that mass to whatever was left of it to burst and, and create the hemorrhage. Luckily, I didn't lose consciousness, so that was a good thing. But, you know, each subsequent surgery, uh, you know, took a little bit more from my right side just because, you know, of my ignorance and arrogance uh, around that stroke. And it's funny because they never really gave me a root cause for that mass mm -hmm. or the stroke, but they all seemed to say it was about stress. I hear that a lot. A lot of those uh, cavernous malformations, the ar arteriovenous malformations and all of those related types of things, a lot of them, uh, you know, are with folks from birth and right. they're just fine until one day when they're not. And just the stress on those those malformed and poorly manufactured blood vessels just may start leaking slowly or start leaking fast or just completely fail. I mean, we uh, uh, last year we talked with Ella Sophia, who had her stroke at age 14, again, from one of those those malformations. And uh, we've talked to a number of folks that. Yeah. And unless you're getting brain scans for some reason, nobody's going to know that it's there until it starts causing problems. It's funny that you say that I had a god sister that had a stroke on her when she was a toddler. Mm -hmm. And she's had this condition all her life. And then I go back to the number of different brain traumas I've had before. Like I've, I've fallen down. I have staples in my head. I've fallen through a glass table. I fell into a stone step. And all these were probably uh, the divine, if you believe in that or not, trying to say, hey, you should get a brain scan. And if we would have gotten it back then, I might have seen it. But 
that today, Bill, you're actually the, only the second person to say that this has been, has been there since birth. The first time I heard that was in all the way in 2019. And that was the first time I had heard that. I was like, wow, this actually could have been there since I, uh, I was born. So uh, it's really reaffirming to know that I didn't come upon some uh some type of substance or some type of chemical or I did something wrong to develop it. It just was there. Right. It wasn't the boxing that, that created it. <laughs> so you have the stroke and you wake up in the hospital. And how, how long were you in the hospital at that point? When I got there, I think it was like September 18th. I didn't leave. I went to the hospital, the first hospital for a week. And then I went back, went to a rehab hospital until about the end of October um, so I wasn't there for long. And because it was on my dominant side, the deficit, I was able to recover more quickly. So I regained a lot of functionality. I haven't been able to run since then. Track and cross country was a big part of my life. So I was a runner. So that was a big factor that weighed negatively on me. But it was relatively a quick recovery. Again, it was on my dominant side, so I didn't have to do much. I just had to get my brain to say, hey, remember how to do this stuff. And then I was out of school for like a month and no until the next semester so i went ended up going back to school at the end of january in 2015 at this point i'm i'm about four and a half years out from my stroke and and i can't run yet either sort of if i get back into pt once some of this covid stuff dies down a little bit further that's sort of my next pt goal is to be able to run not because i ever want to to jog uh, or run for pleasure, which has been alien to me my entire life. <laughs> but I, I would like the ability to extract myself from a dangerous situation should I find myself in it. So you're you're then you're just over a month in the rehab hospital after your time in uh in the the hospital for the acute care. What was your favorite memory from your time in rehab? I'm a New York Giants fan. I as a sad state of affairs right now, but we'll deal with it. Um and my first physical therapist was a Patriots fan. Oh. And you know, back in 2011, and I forget the other year, but we gave them a tough time. So I really enjoyed having the back and forth pants with him. <laughs> and it took my mind to a place where I could be uh, fully present with my body, but not have to be so focused on my deficits. I really enjoyed conversating with him on a day to day basis. And his energy uh, gave me energy to keep pushing. Well, that's great to uh, be able to connect on that level and bring that energy and help you focus on your recovery without, uh, while putting you in a position where you're not distracted by your deficits. That that's great. And I I grew up in New York, so I understand not 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 wanting to put up with those Boston teams. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but so you're going through your uh, your 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 PT and your OT. Uh, were you doing speech therapy as well in your rehab? I didn't have to do speech until my last surgery in 2017. That brings us to a very, very interesting point then, too. A lot of folks find that the stroke is really sort of the culmination of their health challenges leading up to that point, And then the rest is recovering and rebuilding a life and doing all sorts of things that way. But in your case, I mean, your stroke was it's really sort of the midpoint in your health crisis then, what happened then over those next few years? Yeah, Bill, it, it's interesting because, I mean, when I think about other people's journeys, it, it's like you said, the, the stroke was like, all right, now I'm in recovery. Now I'm going to build my life again and, and things like that. Well, the stroke didn't rob that much from me. It was a traumatic experience, but it didn't take that much that I couldn't get back with my age as an advantage. But after I went back to school, I remember going into a, a checkup with my neurologist doing an MRI, and he kind of sat it down in his office, and he was deflated. And I was just looking at him, and my mom and dad were looking at him, and he, he looked up, and he said, uh, I don't know how to say this, but the um, the mass has come back, and it's uh, bigger and faster, growing bigger and faster. Wow. And I'm just like, is this reality? Is this really happening to me at this stage of my life where I'm in the prime of my youth and this is happening? And I remember my mom, you know, breaking down, my dad holding her, and then something clicked. I don't know what it was. And like the words, it, sort of like I threw them up. It was like, 
yeah, so I know you're going to take time to think about this. And I was like, sign me up for the next surgery. And I was just in my head. I'm like, did I just say that? Mm -hmm. And the doctor looked at me and my mom and dad looked at me and they were like, you don't want to think about it. And then again, no, just sign me up. And I was just like, oh, well, I guess we're doing this. So we, we signed up for the next surgery. Um, that was in October, 2015. And no one really talks about this much is outside of our community bill, like the stroke and the, the surgeries themselves typically weren't the most difficult part. It was the recovery. It was dealing with the fact that things were different. It was the fact that you weren't who you thought you were going to be anymore, uh, who you had planned to be for the rest of your life. So it was those in between periods after the surgery uh, that were the most difficult for me for in particular, the second surgery in the hospital. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are. Maybe some of your audience is familiar with opioids and they were giving me regular dosages of fentanyl in the hospital. And that's like uh, heroin times 50. So I remember every hour they would come in with a needle and just shoot me up. And then, you know, they uh, did a, answer nasal approach that's the approach when they basically drew through my skull through my nose through my carotid arteries to get to the mass and they had to turn my brain off is the way they said it um and i just remember waking up and the amount of pain i mean they were draining i had a, a spinal tap so the way they were draining brain brain fluid uh on a scale from one to ten in pain that was like a 37 mm. so i thought i was very uh I proposed that they used um, some fentanyl. But as a result, when I left the hospital, you know, I, I still craved the the opioids in, in a way. So I got addicted to per Percocet and, um, you know, any other type of painkiller I get my hands on. I, I adopted that habit. Um, and that was a very tough period for me after that second surgery. Yeah, I can imagine. The, the opioids are... They are such a boon and a lifesaver to a lot of folks who live with chronic pain. But when it goes wrong and when it turns into addiction, I mean, that is just such 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 a terrible thing to have to have happen. Uh, so, I mean, how was so, so you developed this addiction then to the painkillers as you started taking them because you were in legit legit pain in a medically supervised environment uh but i mean how did you how did you then get through that how did that uh it, it sounds like uh i mean what was your experience then like going through trying to feed that addiction and then ultimately getting off of it or getting through it um i remember when it really took off, I mean, they weaned me off of fentanyl, then they gave me on Percocet, then they gave me some type of thing called fear set when I left the hospital. And I was supposed to wane off that. And I remember one day where I was like sweating and, you know, you wane off, you take the last every hour or whatever. Um, and I remember like trying to sleep in between the periods where I'm not taking it and wake up exactly when I'm supposed to take the next one. And I was sweating and I was like getting agitated. And I remember one day, it was down to the last couple of pills. And it were 12 hour gaps. And one pill every 12 hours. And I got up that morning and I was the first time I knew what withdrawal was. Like I had a headache, my body ached, everything was hurting, and I just wanted the pills. Um, and then when I went back to school, I actually found an old script for Percocet. So I was like, oh, I'll just fill it just in case. And then I felt like a tiny headache and I took it. And I was like, whoa, this is more than painkiller. This is like euphoria. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was the best way for me to continue if I didn't feel any pain, but I can get out of this post-stroke, post-surgery depression that we all often face. Um, taking these pills would be the way to fill my habit. And then I got used to the Percocet, so I was like, oh, I'm going to get a, hand, a hold of promethazine, codeine, and started mixing those things, and alcohol, and marijuana, and all those things, you know, we have access to as a college kid, but um, just to feed the habit. And it became more of a emotional and mental addiction than a physical habit, because my body didn't need it. I wasn't in really any pain anymore. It was almost 
as an escape from my present situation, not being able to accept the fact that I was no longer the straight A stellar athlete, but I was who I didn't want to be, who I thought was less of a man, less of a person. So it was in a uh, in that way. One of the things I realized, and I constantly remind myself now, is that when you are doing a thing strictly for yourself, you lose the uh, the fire to fight. So I realized I have a younger sister at home, I have parents at home, my grandma, my family, my friends, that I want to show them that getting through this is possible. So one day I just got up, I picked up the pill bag, and I flushed it down the toilet, and I went cold turkey. Wow. And did that stick? It stuck. I haven't touched uh, anything above a Tylenol since. Wow. Congratulations. That is That is really impressive. It was a challenge, I'll say that, Bill, because I felt like as those pills drained, I was just hearing this voice like, you just ruined your life, you're never going to recover, you're going to be in so much pain, and, you know, I think the pain was more emotionally and mental, but, you know, I did that, and I refocused myself from finishing my finishing school, and for the next year or so, everything was fine. I mean, still out in deficit, still was, you know, adjusting, but everything was fine, and then, you know, September came around again, which is Usually the month where I get bad news in relation to my brain stuff. And this is uh, 2017. So I, I, I think uh, a couple of things you, you, you mentioned there is, you know, it was, the, it was a chance to experience that euphoria following the stroke. And you mentioned dealing with depression. I think what we're just seeing now is we're actually seeing a lot more research come out about post-stroke depression uh, as a condition. Obviously, uh, once somebody has depression, it becomes a lot harder to go ahead and do what you have to do for recovery, whether that's going to be your at-home PT, your OT exercises, building plans, building for the future. And depression lies to you and tells you that there's no point and you shouldn't do that. And and so that hinders recovery that way. And then what we're seeing is the research is showing there is stroke uniquely causes depression in a lot of folks uh, just due to the nature of the trauma uh, in a way that, uh, you know, heart attacks uh, survivors don't experience it in the same way. And so seeing that research and having, having those conversations in the industry, I think, is is really important to understand that somebody who – that after a stroke, when your life is upside down, everything is completely different, that, yeah, it can be hard to see through to the other side. And that that brief experience of euphoria can be, you know, just that much more enticing. Absolutely. And I, you know, I didn't, again, these are conversations that I wasn't having around the time that all this occurred to me. You know, I heard depression and I'm like, mm, I mean, I guess I don't know what that has to do with me. I'm 20, 20 years old, 21, 22 years old. It has nothing to do with me. My life is fine. I'm in the prime of my youth. Um, but later I found out, you know, through people like yourself, Bill, and different podcasts I was on, different there were survivors that the research is now actually showing that post-stroke depression is actually a real thing. It's not just something that somebody made up. Um, and it did. I remember coming home from outpatient PT and, you know, with this pa pa packet of exercises to do. And I'm just like, I'm not doing that. What's the point? Like, why would I continue to do this? I'm never going to get better. Why do I need to continue struggling if I'm just going to be like this for the rest of my life? And that was the biggest cycle of thoughts in my head. And then they were over and over and over again. So I, I, I definitely believe that depression hindered my recovery. Um, it could have been a lot better. It could have been a lot more whole than I am now. But I do still have time ahead of me, too. And there are more procedures coming out that, uh, that can really help our community. I know there's some type of study in uh, Florida where they give you like a shot of something in your neck and it kind of reverts some of those symptoms. So, you know, now I'm starting to look forward to those type of things and just keep my recovery strong, keep my mental gratitude and things like that. 
what you were saying there, those are the lies that that depression tells that you're never going to get better, that things are never going to change. Uh, I, I began to understand that stuff more uh, from a blog post by uh, by Will Wheaton. Star Trek fans will know him as uh, the former Wesley Crusher. Uh, who has struggled with a lot of that stuff in his later life. And he is, he's written an article. He, he had a blog post a few years ago specifically about depression lies. And when you think about it that way, it, it really, really has an impact on, uh, on, on that. So, I mean, after you've gone through this, this route with the, uh, the painkillers and gotten past that, uh, what was then the next, uh, element of your brain surgery did that last surgery stick or did you have what was the what was the next chapter in that path so after i kicked the addition I, addition i found a girl and you know i continued my college journey i was like i'm determined to finish in my last semester i took 23 credits wow uh, i walked the stage i mean i still have one class to go but i took that online so I was like, yeah, I'm done with this. You, you, like everything is behind me. So I graduated, had a job, had a car, had a place to live, had the girl, and they all were generally in the same area. So I didn't have to travel too far. So I thought, this, this is a great life. I just, you know, after all that, this is a great life I'm living. So, you know, that happened in 2015. Uh, this is 2017, right after I graduated. I started two, working two days after graduation. And, uh, you know, I was ready to take on the world. And then I started going to the gym and, you know, I was doing my chest presses, my bench press, squats. And I remember one day I was doing a squat and the minute I went down, it was like, you know, when you get up too fast and you feel dizzy, like the world doesn't seem real. <laughs> like I felt that sensation reverberate throughout my body. And when I stood up, everything went back to normal. And I was like, okay. Okay, so I did it again. I went to the next machine and the same thing happened. So I'm like, all right. And I remember, you know, days after sleeping in my apartment, head is going crazy. I set up a doctor's appointment and I drive there the next day. Doctor isn't there. I go back to work and he asked me one question. Do you need to go to the hospital? And I'm just like, here we go again. So. That day, we went back to the hospital, and I said, yeah. And one of the things, Bill, and maybe this has happened to you or someone in your community, I don't understand why every time we go to the hospital, I have to tell them the entire story. <laughs> like, why do I have to tell you back in 2014 when I came to the same hospital, like, don't you have the record? So I had to tell the whole story. And they said, yeah, there's definitely a bleed up there. Um, but it's stable now. I ended up going home and had to come back because I started getting double vision, dizzy. And they, uh, the doctor just simply said, look, I've done this surgery twice. I don't think I have the expertise, um, you know, necessary to complete this. And I talked to the last surgeon that worked with me. He said if he was sending his family to anyone, he was sending them to Dr. James K. Lou. Now, he's in New Jersey, and there's a whole cabacle around the whole search for a doctor but it ended up being Dr. James Liu. And we went up there and that surgery was about 15 hours. Wow. And um, yeah, it, it worked. That one actually worked. Um, but again, the, the, my time in the hospital, different infections, different uh, blood clots. And I just felt it was a really harrowing experience, but that, is the one that stuck, but I had to essentially start over. I had to learn how to walk, talk, write, all the things you normally lose um, or you do lose uh, cognitively. I mean, I can still think and get my thoughts together, but by putting the words together, I don't have any feeling on the left side of my face. Uh, I didn't have any feeling on the right side of my body. I had a ringing in my ear. I was basically blind in my left eye. Um... But I'm recovering a lot of that now. But that surgery w was the final nail in the coffin as far as the physical recovery in my brain. So, so you now have effective plumbing in your brain, right? And, <laughs> and that's that's really what we want today. You're 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 still dealing with that uh, lack of feeling in the face, and you know that's that's one of the things that's really interesting in my in my experience. The way I used to describe it during that month in the hospital was that it felt like the left side of my face was just filled with way too much Novocaine. Uh -huh. 
yeah, in, in my case, most that feelings all come back. But there's like a a one uh, a half inch spot on my lip that has no feeling, and it's just really weird how those things happen and what reconnects and what the brain just doesn't reconnect to. When I did lose that feeling, I remember standing in the cold. And I would kind of use this face where I can't feel anything. It's like a shield. When the wind is blowing this way, I would just turn my face that mm-hmm. way. And it would shield the rest of my face from the cold. But it can be dangerous because if something boiling hot hits my face, I won't know about it if I'm if there's snot or blood coming around my nose. I don't know often unless someone tells me. Um, but that, that surgery, the, the deterioration I experienced before the surgery and the buildup I had to do after the surgery probably the most two difficult experiences in, in my journey to recovery thus far. Wow. So what got you through that? You know, I I, I definitely will not say, will, will say for a fact it was not my own willpower. There were days where weeks where I just lay there like, uh, why, not, why did I have to get up? Why didn't that surgery not take? Why didn't I just fade the black in the hospital? Those type of thoughts. But it was my grandmother, my, my dad's mom, um, it was the my girlfriend at the time. It's my sister. It was the people around me and the friends, the love I received. Uh, here's the here's another crazy twist. So for that surgery, but it was one point two million dollars. Before going to the hospital, I started a GoFundMe campaign. They ended up raising about ninety k or something like that, uh-huh. which, which was really good. And then my grandma is really persistent. She's an entrepreneur at heart, so. She was like, well, you know, you can't get blood out of a turnip. And I was just like, what, what are you talking about? What does that even mean? He was like, these people keep sending you bills and asking for money, but if you don't got it, they can't get it. So what we did is call the insurance company every day for a couple of weeks. And eventually my insurance kicked in and covered the rest of that bill. So I was able to use the GoFundMe money for outpatient payer, anything else that I needed medically. Um and, and that was a big help to my spirits. But it was, again, the community and people around me and the relationships I built over time that really got me through that slump. It wasn't it wasn't that I was super strong. It wasn't that I was super uh, motivated to do so. It was the people around me that really gave me the spark to continue. And now I'm here. So I, I thank them greatly for that. And I, uh, I live in a state of gratitude because of that, that moment in my life. It's amazing that uh, when we go through these worst things in our lives, then we suddenly have to become finance and insurance experts and in dealing with all of these details. And uh, uh, when we're least, when us and our family are least able to go ahead and deal with that, but uh, it's great that you were able to get through that and get to a solution. So since then, you've built built quite a lot of other stuff to be able to help other folks out. So, I mean, what what is Victory Coaching? So a lot of times, and I felt this uh, deeply because I experienced it myself, you get the sense of when you're going through this, especially when it happens when you're in the prime of your life or things are going well, uh, why me? Why did this happen to me? And I remember I used to listen to Les Brown all the time, but I couldn't escape the question. Why me? Why me? Why did this happen to me? This is not fair. Well, there were two things. My grandma always used to say, favor ain't fair. It's just favor. And I didn't really understand that until I got on the other side of it and started creating victory coaching and things like that. And victory, um, there's no victory without a battle. And a lot of times, you know, this is my battle. But a lot of times when we get, through that battle, uh, the letter V kind of delineates, you know, you go from the top, the peak of your life, down to the pitfalls, how you face the battle. And at the bottom of the V, there's something called, you have to make a decision, the the bottom of the V, I call it. And um, you either swallow in your defeat, and that's when you move from the area of uh, trying to be great or achieving victory to victimhood. And that's when you move into, you might have been a victim of the situation, but that's when you move into the neighborhood of victims and you buy a house there and you live there and you constantly blame other people or other circumstances for your uh, un, your dismay or whatever's happened to you. But another way is to make that decision to keep going because there is a, another mountain peak that you're going to reach. And another mountain peak, as long as you keep choosing to fight forward, no victory comes out of the battle. So victory coaching is just me Letting helping people 
understand that they may have been victimized, but they are not a victim. They can choose to adopt a different mindset, different habits, different strategies, different success uh, techniques to get to where they want to be. It may not look the way you thought it was going to look, but it's a victory. And oftentimes when people face these things, they find their true purposes out of this darkness. So victory coaching is just to get people to change that perspective and uh, accept that their life might be a little different, but it's actually who you're meant to be because that's who you are. It's just achieving victory in life and despite the fights you face. I like that approach a lot. Uh, and it sounds like your story was really uh, basically a few V's strung together there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, the w- the way I look at a lot of these things is, yeah, a lot of things in our life, maybe it is, maybe it, maybe it is not our fault. Maybe it is lots of other things have, uh, have come to put us in the situation where we're at. Uh, but regardless of how we get to a spot in our life, uh, you know, we always have to ask our question, okay, so what am I going to do with this? What am I going to do now? And- Absolutely. And, it, it, and I often say, Bill, that it's not your fault that you ended up where you are, but it is your responsibility to get yourself out of it. That's how I look at it. That's a great approach. So so you're helping the folks out through uh, victory coaching. And you mentioned uh, your grandmother's pointing out how favor isn't fair. It's just favor. And that seems to have inspired the the title of your book, Favor, How Stroke, Struggle, and Surgery Helped Me Find My Life's Purpose. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about the book. So it, the book is basically my interpretation, my perspective of how the events transpired. Uh, even now, looking back at it sometimes, I'm like, wow, could I elaborate more on that? Or I don't know if that happened exactly the way it happened. But favor is in, you know, it's more of a biblical concept and and that there's a shroud of favor grace or mercy all those things mean the same thing where despite the circumstances you face you face them because you are selected for a greater purpose and i think my greater purpose is to reach back to those who are in the dark who are not fulfilled who are are destitute or depressed about the circumstances that they have faced. And it doesn't just have to be stroke. It doesn't just have to be financial woes, personal woes, personal woes. It can be anything that puts a person in place, but allowing them to see it from a different perspective and learn from the losses or gain lessons from the things that have transpired in their lives. Uh, the book is just telling the story of how we got to that mindset. And now everything I do is inspired by that, whether it's really through coaching or now me, you know, going to screenwriting, um, transferring the book to a screenplay, and I want to continue to write stories about the human experience, perseverance. Um, I'm actually co-directing a documentary called The Art of Resilience, a working title. But I, I just know that this, that, that, and if you look in the dictionary, adversity says difficulties, and then it says misfortunes. And I just told you, Bill, these different V's in my life have been the most fortunate circumstances that have ever happened to me. So adversity is, Gary V says adversity is a foundation of success. And people like us in our community that are survivors uh, often see another set of life that other people don't experience, but we have lessons and, and strategies to give to the world. And I think that's our responsibility to do that because we see things from a different angle once we're on the other side and able to see more clearly. So the book is just telling my story and how I got to this mindset. And now everything I do when I do talks, when I, when I talk in schools, when I write, when I do different stories, whatever I do now is to help people unlock uh, the greatness inside of them to head toward victory and to sh- spread that story of hope, strength, perseverance, and resilience. Well, that's that's great. So, I mean, if uh, another survivor of whatever it is out there decides that they want to write their own book about their experience to help others, I mean, what advice would you give them? Well, a funny story, like when I wrote my book, I was, like most people, born right-handed. But because of that last surgery, I haven't been able to use my right hand, maybe about 30%. So I had to type the book with my left hand. And a lot of the times people, well, I want to get my book published. Well, that's a whole long process. So I 
First thing I want you to do if you're listening, if you're really thinking about writing a book, is just write the book, write the story. No matter how long it takes, no matter who reads it, who likes it, just write the story for you. Because I remember the feeling of catharsis I felt when I completed the volume. The story was crap. It wasn't well written, but it was on the page. And then you can go out and seek an editor or someone else to help you uh, put that into the book. But write your story from fin- start to finish and then look back over it so you can kind of let go of some of that stuff. Because I found that when I wrote my story, it was allowed me to lift that weight from my chest and have it on paper. And, and that was uh, a moment of catharsis. You know, the business of writing, you can go to a publisher, nonfiction, you got to do a proposal, things like that. But I self-published my first book. Um, and that's the way you can do it through Amazon. So I would say write the book and then think about getting it published or whatever. No, that's great. I mean, you know, the very act of writing, you're right. It's very powerful. It's uh, it, it's a way of sort of working things out and just getting it out there and, and being able to do that. I, I recently just had uh, – just had uh, Jeffrey Morse on the show, and he talked about how writing itself made him his own psychiatrist in some respects. I completely agree. When I when I read those pages back, I'm like, wow, I really went through this, and this is how I really feel about it. And I remember, you know, sitting in front of the computer some mornings crying because, like, I just hadn't processed it. A lot of people are so associate PTSD or complex PTSD with wartime situations or traumatic events in combat. But I think survivors, especially those who are spending so many amount of time in the hospital, uh, dealing with the medical system and being in the hospital, unable to help themselves, experience a form of emotional, mental, and physical PTSD as well. So that's something I'm looking into. And that's something you may want to explore. For those of you listening, it's okay to admit that I call it civilian PTSD. Yeah, ab- absolutely. It is definitely a thing. The post-traumatic stress syndrome is definitely something a lot of survivors or even anybody who's had uh, encounters with the medical system does experience. And it's definitely something to to work through because it can impact so much of your recovery. I think the other thing that's really interesting, too, is when you talk about looking back at your book now and thinking, uh, well, I could have expanded on that or maybe that's not quite what happened. I mean, the thing about uh, writing and good writing is that good writing is never finished. A manuscript is never finished. It's only done because you can keep coming back to it and you can keep revising and editing and tweaking and you can do that forever because uh, it's going to continue to evolve. So there just comes a point where you just have to accept that, you know, what you've done, it's done. Let's get it out there. Let's move. Let's and let's move on and let's let it have its life. I remember, you know, hitting that final period on like the last page and my head, I'm like, all right, so right now, now I now do this. And I'm like, wait, I'm done. And that brings us to our hack of the week. But first, let's talk about sponsor Modus Nova. Modus Nova makes devices to help stroke survivors recover the use of a stroke affected limb. The Modus hand and Modus foot are robotic air-powered, AI-controlled exoskeletons that you wear while playing video games. As you play, you are getting the repetitions you need to help rewire your brain with the power of neuroplasticity. And the sensors within the devices are continuing to monitor how well you are moving. They're able to provide more assistance to your limb, or more resistance to give you the most appropriate workout to your particular brain injury deficits. Visit strokegas.com slash modus nova to find out if modus nova is right for you. Use the promo code strokegast for 10% off your first month. And now back to our hack of the week. Uh, just something as simple as dental hygiene. If you want to maybe spend a few bucks on those those little dental floss sticks, whatever, so you don't have to like try to manipulate the string with one hand and floss. Uh, that's been really helpful. Uh, we've talked about this theme a little bit uh, throughout the conversation. Overall, was your brain injury a blessing or a curse? 
You know, if I were to tell someone this story, um, they would often be like, oh, my God, I would never want that to happen to me. That is so dramatic. That's so dangerous. I can't believe you made it through. You're so strong. And I, I'm kind of like, okay, I understand what you're saying, but it's actually the best thing that ever happened to me in my life because I wouldn't have had the opportunity to write this book. I wouldn't have the opportunity to be part of this amazing community. Wouldn't have the time to, or opportunity to write the things I'm doing, to say and speak to people I've spoken to, to have this level of resilience that you build up after something traumatic like this. So it was definitely a blessing because it's given me so many opportunities to do different things that I might not even taken stock of uh, if I had been up on Wall Street or trying to be a politician. Um, the roses are more red. The grass is more green. The air smells, smells fresher. Uh, food tastes better simply because I take the time to acknowledge those things. And that's because of the stroke and everything that happened after it. I love that. Love that. Uh, that, that, that view of that. So, I mean, Quan, folks want to know more about you and what you're up to. Where should they go? Uh, you can go anywhere where you can find people on social media, uh, Facebook, Kwan Glover, Twitter, Kwan Glover, Instagram, Kwan Glover, TikTok, Kwan Glover. Um, but if you want to get in contact with me about speaking engagements, coaching, or anything on my book, you can go to my website, kwanglover.com. Again, that's K-A-W-A-N-G-L-O-V-E-R.com. Or shoot me an info an email at info at kawanglover.com. Again, that's info at kawanglover.com. And I'll get right back with you. Um, that's it for me. Fantastic. And we'll have all of those links over at strokecast.com slash kawanglover uh, and in the show notes. So definitely check that out and, and connect. So, Kwan, this has been this has been fantastic. I'm, I'm really glad we we had this conversation. It's 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 been been a delight talking with you. It's been an honor, uh, Bill, talking to you and understanding that you have a little bit more knowledge than, you know, a lot of the other people I've interviewed with just for my story. But being part of this community and I say would have an open dialogue like this is truly an honor and a blessing. And I'm glad to have met you and I hope you continue to have this relationship going forward. Now, let's talk about sponsor Like Minded. Like Minded is a nonprofit membership program that helps you live your best post-stroke life. Like-Minded offers classes on everything from hand exercises to how to tell your story. The virtual classes are led by survivors, by occupational therapists, physical therapists, doctors, and more. They are held throughout the week, but if you can't attend the one you want, it's okay, because members get access to recorded versions of the sessions, so you can still catch up with the sessions you want to follow up on. If you have a specific question, reach out through the private text messaging group that's also a part of the program. Get the support that you need and deserve to live your best post-stroke life. To find out if like-minded is right for you, visit strokecast.com slash like-minded. Use promo code strokecast to save 20% off your first month. I do really like that Quan mentioned those floss picks. I'll I'll link to some of them in the show notes and over at stropcast.com slash gift guide. I actually use them myself and, and just had a great response from the dentist. The hygienist ended up doing very little scraping, which is something I very much appreciate. Speaking of scraping, I want to talk about scraping our way through the wilderness. See what I did there? I told this story at a few support groups lately, so I think it's time to share it with the broader community. By the way, if your stroke support group is looking for a guest speaker, feel free to reach out to me at bill at strokecast.com. I'm happy to speak with other stroke support groups around the country and around the world. Now, back to the story. I've been thinking a lot about neuroplasticity because, of course, I have. I used to think of it as carving ruts in a dirt road. The idea being that, like, after a stroke, it's like a, a rainstorm that hits the country roads and turns all those roads with road ruts into just fields of mud. And then as you do your exercises, you're driving down to different destinations and putting new ruts in the road, etc., cetera, et cetera, The problem with that, though, if you've ever actually lived in that kind of uh, environment 
is that when you're driving, you really want to avoid those ruts because they can take you to some bad places. But there is some value in the concept behind that analogy. But now I'm thinking about it a little differently. You see, after a stroke, the pathways through parts of our brain are just gone. We know that. It's like in the woods when a road is no longer in use, the trees and the animals and the bushes and the undergrowth all gradually reclaim it. So imagine a place with no roads or paths. It's just lush forest, thick undergrowth, terrain with sudden dips and rises and obstacles. And the first person to get from one side of the forest to the other side needs to blaze a trail. Maybe they use a machete. Maybe it's an axe. Or maybe it's just their hands. But somehow or other, they push through. The forest closes up behind them as the wind and rain shift plants into the void and animals crisscross going about their own business. The first person through may make faint marks along their route. They may go the wrong way and have to turn back and try again. They may ultimately make it to their destination on the other side and call back that they made it. But others may or may not hear them. A second explorer will eventually try to go through the woods. And they'll try to follow the same path. They might or might not succeed. They might or they might not lose that very faint trail. They might take a different route to the destination. Their journey will be almost, but not quite, as hard as the first person's journey. And then a third person will try. And a fourth. And a hundredth. And a thousandth. With each explorer that walks that trail, the trees get pushed back more. The undergrowth gets trampled down and smooth. The correct path is clearer and fewer people get lost. The journey gets faster and it gets easier. And eventually it becomes a path. And then a trail. And then a paved road. And then a highway or a a train line. Communication between the starting and the end point is faster and easier. And throughout all of this, there is a ranger at the beginning of the path, and he either encourages people to try the path and make their mark on it, or he tells them it's closed, that you can't get there from here. Folks, this is neuroplasticity after a stroke. There may be no connection between the part of the brain that wants to move your hand and the part that sends the move signal to your hand. You've got to try to get from one part to the other. Each OTPT or speech therapy exercise repetition, each single repetition that you do represents one explorer that you send into the woods, and they don't all succeed. But the more reps that you do, the easier it becomes to make that connection through the brain. The ranger at the head of the trail is your attitude. Either it's encouraging your brain to try to make those connections or it's discouraging it. The right, positive, action-oriented attitude does not guarantee success, just like an encouraging ranger does not guarantee it. But a negative attitude, one that closes the trailhead and tells you not to try, does guarantee failure. So keep blazing that trail in your head to get where you want to to go, because that's how you're going to get those results, those ongoing repetitions of blazing that trail from one part of your brain to the other. So be sure to check out the show notes or visit strokecast.com slash Kwan Glover to find all of Kwan's links and to learn more about his journey. Share this episode with someone you know by giving them the link strokecast.com slash Kwan Glover. Subscribe for free to the StrokeCast monthly email newsletter at strokecast.com slash news. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. 
Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Strokecast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.